Well, it's class time, and I invite you to gather with us around the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse number 5. Hebrews 10, beginning at verse 5. And really, to be thorough tonight, we need to go through verse 10. Hebrews 10, 5 through 10, that paragraph of Scripture. And here's why we need to cover uh, those verses. Because uh, Paul here is quoting uh, an Old Testament passage. He is quoting one of the Psalms. We'll learn in just a minute, Psalm 40. Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. And he is applying them to the Lord Jesus. Uh, class books have been written on how the New Testament uses the Old Testament. How the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, and if it's not a full quote, how it alludes to the Old Testament, points back to the Old Testament, and more than that, how it interprets the Old Testament. Uh, an enjoyable book I read several years ago, how Paul uses the Old Testament. It's intertextuality. One text, the New Testament. Quoting another text, the Old Testament. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 5. And we're jumping right in to the Psalm 40 quote. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world... Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, I'm going to stop right there. That pronoun he, that's Jesus. Well, now, Brother Bagwell, if I turn back to Psalm 40, I'm pretty sure that I'm, I'm going to learn that it is written by David. I'm glancing. I'm glancing back there now. Psalm 40. I know the answer, but uh, when I say something, I sure do like to be able to validate it. A psalm of David. But yet you're telling me David, as he wrote, was speaking of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm telling Psalm 40 is messianic. It points to Jesus. Oh, this is a terrible word to use, but I think I'm going to. Jesus hijacked Psalm 40. He said, no, 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 David, this is not about you. This is about me. This is about me. I'll prove that as we get into our class. Wherefore, when he, Jesus, cometh into the world. Now, when did Jesus come into the world? I'll need an amen here. Jesus has always been God. Jesus has always been God the Son. There's never been a moment there wasn't a second person of the Trinity in all of eternity past our future. But there was a moment when Jesus came into the world. And what was that moment? I'll need a name, man. The virgin birth. We call it, we call it the incarnation. That means when God took upon himself human flesh, born as a little baby. And the little baby increased in wisdom and stature. In fact, the little baby grew. God incarnate. Literally means in Latin, God in flesh. Therefore, when he, Jesus, cometh into the world, cosmos, the, the earth, he walked, planet earth, in and around, we say, the Holy Land, Israel. Seldom did he go far from the area of his birth, of his life, and of his death. Furthest I can remember at the moment, down to Egypt when he was a little boy, and then up to the Phoenician area where the Syrophoenician woman, where Jesus met her deepest needs. When Jesus was come into the world, he saith, he saith, we're fixing to learn something. Paul is writing it, so the Holy Ghost is telling him, but on top of that, he is quoting Psalm 40. We know what Jesus said 
when he came into this earth. Well, he said a lot of things. The sayings of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He said a lot of things. And Revelation 2 and 3. But, but especially, he saith to his Father, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. And would is there, uh, the verb is thelo, to desire, to want most of all, to yearn for. This is what Jesus just said to his father after he was born, and as a, as, a, as, a, as a young man. Father, all those sacrifices, I want to get it right word for word, all of the offerings, that's not what you really wanted. That wasn't your heart's real desire. Father, you full well knew all those sacrifices, all those are, could merely cover sin. And you needed something better. You needed something that could not only cover sin, get me an amen, but wash away sin, abolish sin. When Jesus came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, Father, but a body hast thou prepared me. A body, soma, S-O-M-A, a body, a human body, thou hast prepared me. Oh my goodness. Jesus is saying that his body became the fulfillment of every bull, every goat, every lamb, every sacrificial animal that was ever slain. The body of an ox, a bullock, is a whole lot bigger than Jesus' body, but it was not more powerful than Je Jesus' body. Sacrificed, he laid it down himself on the old rugged cross. His precious blood flowing from that pierced body, that's what God has got to have. That's the only thing that will satisfy God's judgment, God's wrath, God's holiness, and let a sinner like Mike Bagwell go to heaven when he died. A body thou hast prepared me. Can I discuss that word, thou hast prepared? Cartatizo. Cartatizo. Uh, and preacher, what does that mean? It means to complete, including all of the minor details. It means to accomplish a task, including, including from start to finish, including all of the little areas that might be overlooked. Carta teaches This pictures God preparing Jesus' body to come into this earth. Let me see if I'm getting this. A body thou hast prepared. This is Jesus in Psalm 40 talking to his father. The sacrifices of bulls and goats, that's not what you wanted. Father, you knew that wouldn't work. By the way, the line that God's not delighted and pleased in those sacrifices, it occurs again and again sometimes in the Old Testament and right here in the book of Hebrews. We'll see it, the Lord willing, if, if I have time to get it in. Lord, that's not what you wanted. So God, you knew the real solution. You knew the only solution. You let, your, you let God the Son, Jesus, come to earth and you prepared him a body in which to live. Carta Tezo, you prepared that body. Uh, let me give you an example of Carta Tezo used elsewhere in the New Testament. Jesus walked by and, oh, there's Simon Peter. He's casting his net into the sea and Jesus will say, hey, hey, follow me. I'll make you a fisher of me. And then John, John is sitting up in the boat mending the nets, mending the nets. You won't catch much fish. You won't catch many fish. You won't catch unless, if, you, if your net's got holes in it, you're not going to catch Mending the nets, that's cartatizo. God the Father crocheted. God the Father did the needlework. God the Father took care of the details. 
when he prepared a body for the Lord Jesus. This is sort of off the subject, but give me two minutes here. In Psalm 139, I believe I can prove to you, I want to say beyond the shadow of a doubt, and that's where my heart is settled, how when you, class, every one of you, sir, you and ma'am, you, every one of us, God the Father oversaw our development in the womb. It has God fashioning us forming us, building us when we were still in our mother's womb. That's one reason I can't support abortion right there. God's already at work in that little unborn darling baby boy or baby girl. God certainly was at work in preparing a body for his son, the Lord Jesus. Listen to verse 6. This is still Jesus talking to his father. In burnt offerings and sacrifices, burnt offerings, those would be those would be offerings that demand blood. Sacrifices, that's likely the offerings that did not demand blood, primarily the meal offering that was grain, wheat, grown out in the field. In burnt offerings, and sacrifice his father, thou hast no pleasure. You do not get any pleasure in those offerings. You know what that's implying? Please get it. Don't miss it. That God got pleasure in the death of his son. The whole burnt offering, Leviticus 1, Jesus dying to please his father, to complete his father's will on earth, God smelled of it and said, it's sweet savor. I'm pleased with his death on the cross. The meal offering, which again consists of wheat, of grain, finely ground. God smelled of it and he said, sweet savor. I'm pleased with the way my son, the whole burnt offering is the way Jesus died. The wheat offering, I can't explain it. I did several classes. That's the way Jesus lived. God said, I take pleasure in that. And the peace offering, where an animal dies, God the Father gets part of it, the fat, and the high priest gets part of it, the shoulder and the breast, and then the old sinner, the offerer, the worshiper, he gets part of it. That's God the Father, God the Son, the great high priest, and me sitting down in a meal in fellowship. Hallelujah. I said, that one, I take pleasure in that one. But in the sin offering, in the trespass offering, Overall, even in the ineptitude and the inability of all the Levitical offerings to to deal with sin, they could only cover sin, they couldn't wash it away. Burn offerings and sacrifices, Father, thou hast no pleasure. No pleasure. You know that little verse, simple as it is, helps my faith. As a younger Christian more than now, I used to worry about that aspect of God's character. How God instituted the Levitical sacrifices in the Old Testament and for centuries God allowed little sheep to die, little lambs, little goats, and big oxen, bullocks, and, uh, and uh, to cover sin. And it only temporarily covered sin. One day of atonement to the other, year after year after year, morning sacrifice. And, and it, it grieved me, I thought. All those little sheep had to die. Little innocent lambs had to die. All those, and then I, I heard about it. A preacher shouldn't have even quoted him. Uh, an Old Testament so-called professor in a liberal seminary, he said this, the God of the Old Testament loves blood, he loves sex. The God of the Old Testament is a bully, always going around killing a bunch of innocent animals. And that stuck in my mind for a while. I know better now. I've reasoned it through the scripture. This verse, verse number six, has really helped me. Father, you didn't have any play. 
The sheep had to die. It's a picture of covering sin. It's teaching an object lesson to the Jew that sin must be covered until Jesus, the Son of God, can come and sin will be finally dealt with. Uh, uh, sin will finally be washed away forever. Father, you didn't take any pleasure. It was necessary, but you didn't delight in it. You didn't take any pleasure in it. Oh, hallelujah. What a Savior. He gave His only Son that we might be born again, gave his only son, and that's not necessary for the little sheep and the little lambs to die in burnt offerings and sacrifice his father. You had no pleasure. Then said I, look at verse 7, Hebrews 10, then said I, this is still Jesus. And we're still quoting Psalm 40. We're going to look at Psalm 40 in a minute. Then said I, Lo, I come. That word lo, it is a Greek verb that means look, stare, ponder, don't miss it. Lo, I come. Hallelujah for that. Hallelujah for that virgin birth. Hallelujah for that trip to Bethlehem Joseph and Mary took. Thank God for the angels that sang. Thank God for the shepherds that worshiped. But thank God most for his darling son laying in that manger who'll grow up down the cross and be my Savior. Then said I, lo, I come. Lo, I come. And then class, I want you to notice something. There uh, is a parenthesis, a parenthesis set off by parentheses, this and that markers punctuation marks. Uh, what is that Prince? Jesus said, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Jesus has studied his Bible. <laughs> Understatement. Jesus is a master of Old Testament Scripture. Jesus is probably the greatest scholar on the Psalms that ever lived. He's the omniscient Son of God. And Jesus said, I have learned. I believe God the Father taught him. The little verse, Luke 2.52, Jesus increased in wisdom and in statue and in favor with God and man. God the Father taught. He said, son, read Psalm 40. And probably in synagogue school or Mary teaching him at, at her knee, Jesus memorized Psalm 40. And... Uh, and uh, Jesus, I want you to know it's talking about you. It's tough. Here's Psalm 40. I wrote it down. I'm going to read it to you in a minute. And we're going to notice one little point of difference in the way Paul quotes Psalm 40 in Hebrews 10 and what Psalm 40 says in the Old Testament. A difference brought about by the interpretive power of of the Holy Ghost of God. Jesus learned in the volume of the book, I've learned it is written of me. Oh my, Genesis writes about Jesus. Exodus writes about Jesus. Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, all write about, I, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Oh, along this line, the sweetest little verse in Isaiah 50. May I read it to you? This is Jesus talking. 700 years before he's born, the Lord God, my Father, Isaiah 50, verse 4, note takers, he hath given me the tongue of the learned. God teaches me. My Father helps me learn. God the Father hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that's weary. God's teaching Jesus to encourage and to love and to go about doing good. Listen to this. He wakes me morning by morning. God the Father woke up his son every morning. He wakeneth me morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learn. That's where Jesus learned about Psalm 40. Paul had his Arabian experience, three years learning the thing. Jesus, every morning early, the Father woke him. I have learned in the volume of the book, 
It is written, David thinks he's writing about himself. He's really writing about me. Lo, I come, I'm in verse 7, still quoting Psalm 40, to do thy will, O God. I have come to do thy will, O God. To do, it is that favorite little verb, poeo. When Jesus came to earth and did his Father's will, poeo, I come to do, poeo, thy will, God, Father. Jesus became a poet, poeo. He became the author of poems, many poems of beautiful obedience, poeo. Jesus became an artist. I have come to do thy will, O God. And, and the word where he says, I have come to do thy will, O God, it's thelema. It comes from thelo. Whatever you want, whatever you desire. God, I'm going to figure out, Father, I'm going to figure out what pleases you the most, and that's what I'm going to do. And this was God's. Here's the apex, the mountaintop. Here's the highlight of God's will for Jesus, that he die on the old rugged cross to do in his body, through his blood, what the bodies of bulls and goats and oxen and their blood could not do. I have come to do thy will. O oh God. Wow. Verse 8. Now when he said above, when he said, the lines above, he's quoting Psalm 40. Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin. He's about named them all. The whole burnt offering, the sin offering, the meal offering. Sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin. Thou wouldest not. Father, that's not what you wanted. It's in place. It makes atonement. It comes, but that's not your real heart's desire. Neither hast thou pleasure therein. God, you didn't take pleasure in the death of all those little animals. It was a necessity because man had to learn. He had to get an object to teach. Sin can be covered till the sin bearer comes and washes it away forever. That has no pleasure therein. I'm at the end of verse 8. Those things that are offered by law, those things that are sacrificed, prospero, those things that are brought to the brazen altar by the law. Verse 9, then, there's a little bit of repetition here, and it's okay. When the Holy Ghost repeats, I say amen. When a lazy preacher repeats a sermon because he don't want to study for a new one, I don't say amen. When the Holy Ghost repeats, it's for emphasis. He's never made a mistake, and I really say amen, amen. Then said he, Jesus, talking to his Father, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Lo, I come to do thy... What if I told you this? Will anybody amen it? I don't think there was ever a day in Jesus' life. I'm going to go further than I don't think there was ever an hour. I don't think there was ever a minute. Can I? I don't think there was ever a second in Jesus' life he was not consciously doing his Father's will. I can hear him now in John. I always do the things that please my Father. I have meat to eat, you know not of. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. I have come to do thy will, O God. And then Paul begins a little bit of interpretation. I'm at the end of verse 9. Jesus, he taketh away the first that he might establish the second. I, I say Jesus, he could as easily this would be grammatically hard to determine. Could as easily be God the Father. He taketh away the first, the first covenant. The dispensation of the law, he taketh it away. I think I know that verb, but, but uh, let, me, let me look it up. Taketh away. Anna, and then the root is Iro. We've had it before. Jesus took away our sin. God the Father took away the law. He took away the first covenant, lifted it up, 
tear it through it away. That he might establish the second covenant. That's what it says. That he might establish, and that verb establish, it's the histomai verb, histomai verb. It means that he might make it stand. The law is no longer standing. God laid it aside. The second covenant. Jesus' blood shed and death on the old rugged cross. It's got to mean that. God has made it stand. God has ordained it. God has institutionalized it. And I have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Let me read it to you. Let me read it to you. God taketh away the first. Oh, <clears throat> that he might establish the second. In the sense that God is writing his word in my heart, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, in the sense that my sins are gone, God said, I will remember your sins no more. I am a beneficiary of God's covenant with Jesus on the cross of Calvary. I am a beneficiary of the shed blood of my Savior. I'm enjoying, technically, if you want to press it to the nth degree, second covenant, the new covenant, the new covenant, that Israel, God's going to institute it with Israel. At the end of the tribulation, Israel's going to be saved. God's going to write his law in her heart. God's going to remember her sin. God's going to save her. What's left of her, the remnant. But right now, you're looking at a blood-washed boy. You're looking at a boy. God remembers his sins no more. God laid aside the first covenant that he might establish, ordain, set up, perpetrate the second. Well, tell me more about this second covenant. Tell me more about the cross. Tell me more about the slain body and the shed blood of Jesus. Tell me more, if you will, about this second covenant. Verse 10, verse 10. By the which will, God's will, by the which will, Jesus desired to do God's will. It's Calvary, it's the cross. By the which will, we are sanctified. We are sanctified. Let me tell you what it means. Lifted up from here and set down over here. That's the meaning of the word sanctified. Hagiadzo, hagiadzo. It means, watch me now, set apart. Put in a far, far different place. Hallelujah. I got, I got, let me see if there's an ED on it. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. ED, sanctified. The day I trusted him as my Savior, the day he washed my sins away, I need some amens. He picked me up out of a miry pit. He got me out of that stinking rotten life and he set me down. It's a miracle of the blood. It's a miracle of the new birth. It's a miracle of it and set me down on the solid rock. And I've been singing and praising him ever, singing to him and praising him ever. Sanctified, past tense. Sanctified. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus. Offering, oh my. Pros, well, the noun is prosphora. The verb is pros and pharaoh through the offering of Jesus. Jesus took his blood that he shed on the cross. Pros pharaoh carried it to heaven carried it to the Holy of Holies, carried it to the presence of God the Father and offered it, sprinkled it at the feet of God the Father. Oh yes, oh yes, through the, uh, so I got saved, through the offering of the body, literal body, broken body, bloody body of Jesus Christ. That's how I got saved. That's the new covenant. That's the second covenant. That's salvation. That's eternal salvation. Need some amens. That's eternal redemption. Praise God. And how did Jesus do this? Once for all. Once for all. He'll never have to die again. I am saved once for all. Never have to get saved again. It's eternal. 
my redemption. Oh, let me point something out I thought was extremely interesting. In our chapter, Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 4, they are negative. They are negative. It is impossible. It can't be done that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. No, it's negative. But oh my, this part, verses 5 through 10, it is positive. What the Old Testament animals can't do, positive. Jesus Christ got it done. Jesus Christ accomplished it once and forever by the offering, his blood and his body, by the offering of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you remember how our chapter began, verses one through four, over and over and over, year after year, day after day, those other, and look how it ends, once and for all, how much more, how much more powerful, effective, precious is the blood of our dear Savior. Now, I've been preaching, teaching 31 minutes, and I haven't yet got to Psalm 40. We've gone through it, and I've preached it from the context, the perspective of Paul and the Holy Ghost in Hebrews 10, 5 through 10. But I want to show you something that Paul changed. Uh, check that. I want to show you something the Holy Ghost changed. Psalm 40, if, for you note takers, verses 6 through 8. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, quoted word for word in the New Testament. But then the New Testament says, a body thou hast prepared me. The Old Testament says, mine ears hast thou opened. The Holy Ghost took that clause in the Old Testament, Psalm 40, my ears thou hast opened and turned it into Hebrews chapter 10. A body thou hast prepared me. I don't have any trouble with that. I don't have any trouble with any interpretation the Holy Ghost does. But he changed ears to the whole body. Oh, there's been a lot of ink, pages and chapters written on why the change. Let me give you two thoughts and class will be over. Or Brother Bag will be over time anyway. Ears, you know why God gives us ears? He that hath ears, how many times did Jesus say it? Let him hear. In Psalm 40, Jesus has ears that have been opened to hear his Father's will. And when your ears are open, I hope I get an amen, your whole body will obey. If my ears hear it right and it gets into my heart, my feet will follow through. My hands will be obedient. My whole body will follow doing the will of God. Could be that. Goes from ears to body because if you really hear it, you will obey it. In God's eyes, you will do it. Then it could be this. And I don't know it positively, but it could be this. Mine ears hast thou opened. Mine ears hast thou opened. And a body thou hast prepared for me. It goes back to a ritual in Exodus 21. Let, let me see. Quickly, quickly, let me give it to you. In the Old Testament, there, there, if, if you get into debt, you could go into it sort of a beneficent kind of a slavery. You could work for the man to whom you owed the debt and work so long and you'd be set free. Or when the year of Jubilee came, you would be set free. But occasionally, and, and so often God allowed it, he, he wrote a precept about a man became a slave of a very kind owner. And the kind owner loved him, fed him well, clothed him, took care of his health, brought his family with him and loved them. And the time of his departure has come. It's time for him to be set free. His day of redemption is where he go back to where he used to live. Go back to... Occasionally it would happen. A slave would say, I don't know. Master, you're telling me I can go free. You're telling me I can be set free. I don't want to go back. I've had it better under you, Lord. 
You've fed me better. I've been clothed better. I'm healthier. You've, my family's been better than, than I ever had it back before. I want to stay with you. I don't want to leave. I, I, I will volunteer to be your slave from now on. Voluntarily submitting oneself to be a servant, to be a slave. When that was the attitude of the slave, they would back him up against the doorpost, take an awl. That's like a that's like a, a an ice pick. Long put take an awl and bore, dig a hole in his earlobe. And that said to everybody, I am now the servant. Not because I have to, because I want to. Not out of obligation, but because I love my master. That may be why. That may be why. The word ears in Psalm 40 is changed to the word body. Oh, hallelujah. The word body in Hebrews 10. Jesus said, Father, I'll be your servant. Not because I got to. Not because it's required. Take my ear. Bore a hole in my ear. Dig in my ear. Pierce my ear. I joyfully, willingly, voluntarily will go to the cross and die, number one, to please you, and die, number two, so lost sinners can be born again. What a Savior. What a Savior. Seems like we've gone through our text rather quickly, but we've covered every word. And of course, I've been teaching 30 Seven minutes as well. Come back tomorrow. Let's take up at Hebrews 10, 11 and get another chunk, another plate full of the meat, of the meat of the Word of God. Well, Brother Bagel, you going to pray with us? Yes, let's pray. Let's pray. God laid earlier today, Hebrews chapter 12, verse number two on my heart. It's going to be our prayer. I'm only going to give you part of the verse, the part I want to pray. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. All we've been doing now for days and days is bragging on our Savior. Looking unto Jesus. Let me give you what that, you know what we need to do more than we do instead of looking at the preacher or looking at the, at the political situation or look at, we need to look to Jesus. We need to put our eyes on him. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above. Paul wrote to the Colossians, looking unto Jesus. What a neat verb, looking. Aphorao. Aphorao. What does it mean? The ah, f, the little a that starts that sound, f. It means, no, no, no. And orao is to gaze upon something. It means this. Don't look at anything else. Don't look at the world. Don't look at the flesh. Don't look at, at all the situations around. Look unto Jesus. Look at him. It literally says, don't look at anything. Don't look at all these discouragements. Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. That word author, ark as in archangel and ago, the line leader. <laughs> I'm in line. I'm going to heaven. And the line leader, my head's already there. Where my head goes, the body will follow. I'm on the way. Looking, not in it, looking away from everything. Looking unto Jesus, the line leader and the finisher. Remember on the cross, he said, it is finished. Jesus got it all done. Not one iota can be added to my salvation. Hallelujah. Father, Help us to look unto you. Help us to look away from the world. Help us to magnify you. Thank you for being the line leader. Thank you for being such a successful Savior and great high priest. And thank you, Lord, for getting it done, both on Calvary and you're getting it done praying for me now. Hallelujah. In your name, amen. I have enjoyed our class immensely. Sitting in a motel room in Augusta, Georgia, teaching some folks that are eager, hungry to learn the Word of God. Don't miss class tomorrow.